uh, it's now my privilege uh, to do the honors here and to introduce our main speaker during this panel, who's Juno Dawson. Um, I'll be sticking very much to the procedure and to the stellar precedent uh, established by Bernadine so far, um, and that I'll be introducing Juno. Uh, she'll be uh, reading from two of her latest works. Uh, we'll have one reading at the beginning, then a bit of a Q&A that uh, everyone eventually will be uh, expected and uh, encouraged to join in, uh, and another reading from her latest book, which isn't even out in bookstores yet. Uh, Juno Dawson was raised in West Yorkshire and has since lived in London and Brighton. Details of her upbringing are sketched in her book, The Gender Games, from which we'll be hearing in a minute. Uh, so I will not offer too many spoilers here, uh, but let me cite some of the creative forces that, according to herself, have informed her evolution as a writer. The list includes cultural items as diverse as Doctor Who, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Spice Girls, and horror fiction. Before becoming a full-time writer, Juno worked as a primary school teacher for seven years, and it took a very long and boring summer for her to give writing a shot, which led to her first novel, Hollow Pike, which was out in 2012. She's quickly emerged as one of the most prolific and productive authors working in young adult fiction today. She has published about two books per year since her debut, winning numerous awards in the process. The list includes titles like Under My Skin, All of the Above, a very, very scary adaptation of the Bloody Mary urban legend called Say Her Name, which you'll find translated into German as Don't Say Her Name, by the way. Um, <laughs> more recently, the novel Margot and Me, which was quite a departure for her. Uh, in terms of it not being uh, a scary young adult book, but more of a multi-generational family epic that takes in female perspectives, female voices over several generations. Uh, they're all absolute page turners, and of course you have a chance to check out her novels, and quite a number of them are present uh, at the bookstore over there. Uh, and there's also several non-fiction titles, primarily aimed, well, at young adults, but of course not only at young adults, even if you're grown up, I can think you can take immense uh, pleasure out of these books and also learn uh, quite a bit in the process. They tend to revolve around topics of gender and sexuality, uh, and they take in many themes that we've already heard about uh, in the last one or two sessions, dating apps, feminism, questions of contemporary feminism, transformative experiences for people of either gender, uh, prejudice and how to overcome it. Uh, these titles include This Book is Gay, uh, which caused a bit of a stir, uh, as you can find on the web, when a parent initiative asked for the book's removal from a public library in Alaska, of all places. Uh, I think there's a story there. Uh, imagine what they would have made of the uh, German title of this book. This has been translated into German as How to Be Gay. Um, so I'm uh, not sure what the implication is there. Anyway. Uh, in 2015, Juno, who was born James Dawson, announced her intention to undergo gender transition and live as a woman, an experience she has written about extensively in magazines and also in The Gender Games, one of her latest books. Juno is not only a vocal defender of her own work and her own position, she also speaks up regularly in matters concerning the LGBT community. Go on Twitter to find Juno calling out bigotry, commenting on popular culture and arguing for trans rights, Go on YouTube to watch her being interviewed, trying to teach Piers Morgan about gender-neutral pronouns, or even patiently discussing, very patiently discussing, I would have to say, with gay conversion therapists. Juno is very active in the world of social media, as you can see, but she doesn't limit herself to speaking out online. In fact, in the gender games, Juno writes, and I quote, if Brexit and Trump signified anything, it's that left-wing, liberal, or moderate voters have got, to go, have got to get the fuck off Facebook or Twitter and go out into the real world. Juno certainly does that, and even if it weren't for her relentless activism, Juno's literary output would speak for itself. This applies equally to her strong-willed heroines and her diverse casts of characters in genres that very often exclude minorities, and let's face it, that's most of them still. Um, so please join me and give it up for Juno Dawson. Hi. Um, I've got a bit of an upset stomach. I don't know what I ate last night or the cold egg. Sabrina and I experienced the same cold egg at the hotel this morning. But if I run off stage, that's why. And Veland is going to sing. 
Um, so get in a request now. And sorry if you're watching this on the live stream, hello. Um, if I go, that's what's happening. I'm shitting myself. Um, but we're probably right. We've only, we've only got like an hour and a half to get through. It's going to be fine. Um, thank you so much, British Council, for having me this one time, I suspect. <laughs> it's, it's not happening again, is it? Um, Thank you. Um, this is such an honor. Um, my first time in Germany, my first time in Berlin. I'm having a blast, and I'm so honored to be featured with authors and poets that I respect so much. Um, I'm going to start off by doing um, two little readings from The Gender Games, which was my first book aimed at an adult market. Um, normally, I'm used to speaking to sort of 15, 16 year olds who you would think would be scarier, but that's kind of where I'm at still mentally. So, um, so I kind of, that's why I feel most at home. So speaking to adults is always quite intimidating. Um, like you will know things and stuff. I don't know anything. Um, I'm gonna start, this bit doesn't really need any introduction. Um, I mean, no, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna read it. I'm just gonna do it. With technical or high-definition hindsight, it's clear my own struggles with gender started the day I was born into a world he'd already done a real number on. So it is necessary to go all the way back to the start. Jesus knows I did not want to write a memoir. I think you should be over 85 before you are allowed to write a memoir, unless, number one, you are a former Spice Girl, or number two, have in some way changed or shaped the course of history, like the Spice Girls. <laughs> Setting the bar low, excellent. I do not claim to have done or be any of these things. For me, in the middle of my gender transition, transitioning is in fact incredibly tedious. I'd give anything to have a day off, to be honest. That being said, childhood stories are relatable and I really want you to like me. Number two, gender is a total pedo. Gender fucks kids. I was fucked by gender as a kid. You were fucked by gender as a child. It happened in childhood. Therefore, grudgingly, I accept we might need to explore my childhood in order to better understand how I became the most beautiful transsexual in Brighton. <laughs> or something. Born in the Wrong Body, a story of survival. When I was little, every night I would lie in bed and make a deal with God. If I'm good, tomorrow can I be a girl? Gender slept at the foot of my bed, curled up in a ball like a contented cat. It was a vivid goal. Every morning I would reach up to see if there were thick chestnut Tiffany Amber Thierson curls spilling across the pillar, only to be disappointed. I didn't get it. I'd been good, mostly. As a small child, I was the architect of an elaborate inner fantasy world. In this parallel universe, I'd have been born Katie Rebecca Dawson. This is the name I'd have been christened with if I'd have been born biologically female. I did not like this name. I do not like this name, hence Juno. Kate, if I'd have been forced, had long blonde hair and dark eyebrows. I don't know who I based her physicality on, but there's just something about blondes, isn't there? Ask little girls which one they prefer, Anna or Elsa. It's possible Kate was somewhat modelled on the cartoon character Tara from Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Kate, in the dream, was never a little girl. Weirdly, even as a child, I wasn't really into childish things. I grew up on Neighbours and Round the Twist and Biker Grove. Children were crap, but teenagers were cool, and I wanted to be one. Kate Dawson popped out aged 14. I didn't think this vivid alternate parallel universe was especially unusual. I thought everybody wanted to be someone else. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the very beginning, even before I was born. You might start to suspect that I'm hiding, shielding, or protecting some aspects of my childhood. That would be because I'm hiding, shielding, and protecting some parts of my childhood. Since the 1990s and the phenomenal success of both reality TV and misery memoirs, we as consumers have come to expect limitless access into each other's lives. 
If I'm standing here telling you my story for money, I should be ready, willing, and able to drag a knife across my belly and spill the entirety of my guts with a smile on my face because this is how we get people to like us. We share everything. A while back, I had a meeting with some TV producers who were interested in my journey, trademark. While Mast had honourable intentions, and one was very much on the same page as me in terms of my gender destruction quest, the general consensus was very much that we needed an angle. Very quickly, little needling fingers were prying into my childhood. Was I sad? Was I suicidal? Was I abused? What were my parents like? It felt like eels writhing around in lube. I came away from the meetings feeling decidedly grubby. In every woman's life, I suppose, comes the moment when she must answer the question, how much of your soul are you prepared to sell to become rich and famous? You can be one, the other, or both, but neither without a degree of sacrifice. Would I exploit my poor mother for an hour of droopy, emotionally manipulative television where Holly Willoughby or someone asks if, has germs died? No, I won't be doing that. And I won't be doing it here either. This is not a misery memoir because I am not miserable. I was not a miserable child. If you are in some way disappointed that my mother didn't burn me with cigarettes or attempt to sell me to a pimp for crack money, I'd politely suggest that you indulge in a spot of therapy. Thanks. <laughs> now, in, in keeping with Monique's reading, I'm going to talk about my sex life, which is the theme of this Friday morning. I bet when you got tickets to this seminar, you were not expecting the zoological guide to vaginas. I know I wasn't. And yet, here we are, second reading of the morning, and it's about sex again. Um, this is the bit that kind of got me into tabloid hot water. Um, so fuck it. Last year, I embarked on a strange and slightly sordid affair with a Premier League footballer. And no, I won't name him or the team he plays for. We met on Grinder. Wait, we're back. We met on Grinder, on which, and I'm going to disagree, it's not just for men, on which you can filter your searches to just transgender women and their admirers. And we hooked up a couple of times. My football player explained that he'd first discovered his attraction to transgender women through a fellow player who regularly bought the services of a trans mistress to dominate him. They'd once had a threesome, which he found particularly arousing. Unfortunately, his teammate was quite territorial over his trans sex workers and told his friend to chip off and find his urn. That's where I came in, thus answering the timeless question, what do you get the 22-year-old millionaire who has everything? Unfortunately for him, I'm not a trans sex worker and have no plans to start. That's not a judgment, I just don't have the time. Furthermore, the man in question had quite specific fetishes. Not only was he turned on by trans women, he also had a thing for hair. Not my hair, his. In order to euphemistically finish, he needed me to tie him to the bed and threaten to shave his hair off with a set of electric clippers. It's not a British thing. I don't... I obliged in this complex setup a couple of times because he was really hot, before realizing I was seeing a terrifying glimpse of my new sexual reality. He offered to pay me to continue the arrangement, but I was done. I imagine some other trans woman is waving shears around his head as we speak and good on her, but it wasn't for me. When I made the decision to plow ahead with my transition, I did so fully aware it might be the death blur to my love life. But, as I told my mother, my previous sex life had hardly been a glowing success either, had it? I thought, especially given my disastrous track record, it would be better to be single forever as Juno than be a gay man for a single second longer. By this stage, I knew other trans people, and they had had boyfriends or girlfriends, but I also knew that shouldn't be an issue. No one transitions to aid their love life. I figured I'd get on with my transition and worry about men in a few years' time. In the words of bad clickbait everywhere, 
What happened next will astound you. Things started simply enough. In 2015, having decided 100% to start my medical transition, I also decided to move back to Brighton after four years in London. This was because A, I was living on a slightly scary council estate in Battersea and didn't fancy wandering around there overnight, and B, my oldest, dearest friends were still in Brighton and I wanted their support. I'd only been back in town a matter of weeks when I started talking to Chris again on Grinder. He was very lovely. He was a bank manager, played in a rock band, had tattoos, and identified as bisexual. Bisexual people get a really shitty time on both the scene and in the media. Gay people regard bisexuals as part-time interlopers. Female bisexuals are, in the eyes of the gay community, straight clit teasers, while bi men are invariably bi now gay later. To straight people, bisexuals might as well be gay if they're not going to conform. The media portrays bi people as slutty, not choosy, hedging their bets, or simply confused. Bisexual people seem to reap neither the privilege of the straight or the community of the gay. I admit, even I was dubious of bi men until I dated one, while I was still living as James. I realised then that bi people who are out are not in any way benefiting from claiming the bi label. There is no reason somebody would purport to be bisexual unless they actually were. So there. Chris told me on our first date in Brighton's wonderful Marlborough that he'd seen Tim Curry's Dr. Frankenfurter at a very impressionable age and had been into androgynous people ever since. Chris was lovely. How easy is this? I thought to myself. There I was thinking my love life is doomed and here comes a new boyfriend. It was a bit of a headfuck, though. I was confused about what he would find attractive in me. When we first met, just weeks into my transition, I was still firmly in the androgyny camp, but changing quickly day by day. I was very impressed with Chris's devil-may-care attitude. When we went on dates to bars and restaurants, people stared at me, of course, as is a trans woman lot, and I felt bad that I was bringing scrutiny onto him as well. What did being with me say about him. One evening in a Thai restaurant, I thanked Chris for being seen with me in public. He took my hand over the table, much to the intrigue of the family sat opposite, and told me how proud he was to be with me and that he couldn't believe his luck that he'd ever met me. My swollen heart almost burst all over the prawn tempura. And that's where the story ends. We had the big white wedding of my dreams and lived happily ever after. Not so. I can't say why for certain, but I wasn't feeling the thing. You can't marry someone just because they're into trans women, and that's a little how it felt. Chris is a wonderful man, and I liked him a lot, but I could sense he wanted more. I think perhaps it was timing. When you're so unsure of who you are, it's probably not a great time to get into a serious relationship. A friend of mine who's in alcoholism recovery says they tell you exactly the same thing in rehab. While I was having a nice time pootling along and having dates here and there, Chris wanted something more serious, and I wasn't able to give him any more. So we parted ways quite amicably. He went off around the world to do some travelling, and for me, the real horror began. After the aforementioned fling with the footballer, I decided to join the dating app Tinder. It's back. I was very, very clear on my profile about my trans status and that I was only there for dates. The joy of Tinder is that it pairs you with a suitor if you are mutually interested. This saves a lot of time. I figured if a man was repulsed and horrified by my very existence, he could simply swipe me left into oblivion. Easy. What I was not ready for was how many men would swipe right and match me. There have been many, a lot, hundreds, more than I would have dared hoped for. It turns out a lot of men are at the very least curious about trans women. However, these men, almost exclusively, have been, shall we say, less than gentlemanly with their communications. Again, I have never been on Tinder as a cisgender woman. I can't tell you if this is the universal experience of Tinder. Please do tweet me your experiences. But almost immediately, these guys have propositioned me for nurse strings, kinky sex. 
It's very clear to me that they see trans women as something straight out of a sexual fantasy. Is this because of porn? There is a lot of trans porn out there. Is it because they have experience of transgender sex workers? There are a disproportionate number of transgender sex workers. There's a lot of material on this second point. If interested, do search out Paris Lees' essays on being a trans sex worker. Some trans women feel scrutiny and transphobia make regular work difficult or impossible. Cash in hand sex work is also a very quick way of making money, especially important if you're privately paying for treatment and or surgery. I am very fortunate in that I'm both self-employed and work in the very liberal arts sector. I've been on a couple of dates with men whose only experience of trans women before me was either porn or sex workers. One guy, seemingly having his epiphany on our date, pointed out that our date was nicer because I actually wanted to be there, showing a stunning insight into how sex work, well, works. The girl's got to eat, however, and I did start a casual thing with a very handsome PE teacher, but it quickly became depressingly predictable. He'd drive over, we'd have dinner, a bottle of wine or two, we'd get it on and it was nice. But then he'd freak out, grab his pants and sprint for the door, leaving a PE, a PE teacher shaped hole in the door. You couldn't see him for dust. Then I wouldn't hear from him for about two weeks, during which time he was clearly freaking out. Then he'd get back in touch to arrange another date. While Mr. PE teacher was apparently on some voyage of self-discovery regarding his sexual identity, I was stuck in the same place I was with my footballer, a service provider. What was in it for me? I have a theory about fetishes. I think if society has no issue with your taste... Tall men, big boobs, leggy women, beards, tattoos. It is a type. If you're into something that society frowns upon, plus-size people, trans people, leather, rubber, water sports, it becomes a fetish. Minority groups are oh so easy to fetishise. While most people speak to any person of colour about their experience on a dating app for awkwardness of fist gnawing proportions, but where do you really come from? But, but, but most people are wising up to how it's not okay to wax lyrical about all sorts of things because of racial objectification. The same courtesy doesn't always seem to extend to trans women. We are things to be used and enjoyed. We are a sexual deviation on a sordid fetish checklist. I've always fantasised about being with a trans girl, start a good number of my Tinder chats, and herein lies the fatal flaw with fetishization. Unless a trans woman has a burning desire to shag someone who objectifies her entirely, it's just not going to work, is it? Never once have I thought, oh my gosh, I'm a kinky conquest for a bored suburban married man that gets me so hot. There is a total, total disinterest in what pleasure I could get out of the arrangement. I know, welcome to porn culture. A generation of young men who've always had access to high quality streaming broadband pornography and never had access to decent sex education at school. You'll be unsurprised perhaps to learn that most of the guys matching with me on Tinder are aged 18 to 26. Older guys are, shall we say, less experimental. This follows. A 2012 study in Psychology Today found that men who regularly watched porn habituated to the dopamine spikes released in their brains and therefore required novelty or more extreme sexual encounters to reach the same high. While recent research suggests there is no correlation between excessive porn consumption and sexual aggression, I'd argue as in sex education, porn is shit. A 2012 literature review showed that in adolescence, porn may lead to earlier sexual experimentation and sexual permissiveness. Women do not come off well in most pornography. Too often they cater to men's desires with little attention given to her pleasure. If there is, her pleasure comes very quickly and with very little effort on the part of her partner. In the absence of adequate sex education in schools, you can see how teenage boys are learning that sex primarily is an activity in which they will gain pleasure and dominance and their female partners will be delighted to receive any at all. This attitude that I should be delighted to serve a man was wholly absent from my gay years. 
On Grinder, it went unsaid that both partners would get something out of the arrangement. Since joining Tinder, I'm a sex toy, an animated blow-up doll. If men are still dividing the female population into Madonnas and whores, you win absolutely nothing for guessing which camp trans women have been sorted into. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks, Juno, for this, um, which uh, was not only very entertaining, very instructive, but I think also gives a very good idea of who you are as a writer, right? Because this was very funny, it was very heartfelt, it was also, to me anyway, very dialogical, even though yes. it was in fact monological, but you're, when you're reading this, you in fact have the, uh, get the idea uh, that you're having a conversation with someone, right? And if I remember correctly, in This Book is Gay, there's also some interactive bits, right, where the reader is asked to fill in uh, some gaps or to relate their experience. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that was, for me, I think how I came to regard nonfiction changed a lot when I first read Kathleen Moran's How to Be a Woman. I think I was very lucky in that I read a really early version of that. I think in about 2010, and it suddenly occurred to me that nonfiction didn't have to be dry, that you could still have a narrative voice within nonfiction. And whereas, obviously, in my novels, I spend time trying to get the voice of a different character, in my nonfiction, the character is me. So it's not really me. I stress there is still an element of character that I'm not nearly as nice as I sound in these books. Um, um, but there is, yeah, so sort of, I always sort of think slightly there's, a, there's like a Katy Perry-ness to me in my nonfiction. I'm way more fun and sparky and bubbly than I probably am in real life, where actually a lot of the time I just hate everyone. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm, I'll assume that this uh, goes on equally well with the young adults that you're talking to, because you're also going into schools, right, and, and presenting your work there. Uh, do they ever ask you to, to like uh, tone it down in terms of doing less explicit bits, right, or mincing your words, which I'm assuming you just you would refuse to do, right? Um, I mean, gender games is different, and that in that you know I wouldn't be talking about the gender games in a high school visit. Um, I don't think I don't think that would be appropriate. With this book is gay. I don't think there's anything in there I wouldn't be happy to do in a school. The whole point with this book is gay was that it was everything that I felt young LGBT people should be getting anyway. It's just that sex education is just not good enough. Um, and yeah, obviously it was, this book is gay has been banned and challenged all over the world, but I'm like, why is it that we can teach 10 year olds how babies are made and how babies are born and how heterosexual sex goes? But as soon as I start teaching the same age group how anal sex would work, all of a sudden it's something we should ban. Mm -hmm. And of course, really, it's just homophobia, plain and simple. I don't think there's any mystery to it. Sure. I mean, uh, from the reaction you showed over the, I'll call it the Alaska incident, mm -hmm. right, because this has been so, so well publicized, where you spoke out about the fact that the public library wanted it removed, and to my knowledge, they refused to do it, right? They didn't cave in. The they were amazing, yeah. yeah. It was Sarah Palin's district, while well, Scylla, oh, Alaska wow. as well. <laughs> Good for you. Um, I mean, that was the interesting thing is that of all the times it has been challenged, that wasn't entirely unreasonable in that it was being um, shelved in children's nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And the original parent who said, should this be here, had a really good point in, in that they didn't have a section for teen nonfiction. Um, but then once the other parents got hold of it, obviously they were chasing the librarians through the streets with burning torches. Um, but the original parent raised quite a valid issue, which is it, it's not a children's book. You know, it, it is for adolescents. Um, of course, uh, your, your general reaction to that one would have been one of consternation and outrage. Um, my guess is that like 5% of you may have been like uh, chiming gleefully at that because I mean you deliberately called it this book is gay which is of course toying with stereotypes right it's like like putting these these uh, cancer warnings on cigarettes like and if people who are terribly uneducated about these things would in fact believe that being gay is something that's contagious and you can catch it from from just touching this book uh, so is there also a little a little element of glee uh, to see this in a way pay off I mean often books which have been challenged are banned in the United States spike in their mm -hmm. sales. The only Debbie Downer with This Book is Gay, the Alaska controversy, was that it happened over Thanksgiving weekend. So, of course, all the publicists were on holiday. Uh -huh. So we had an opportunity to kind of capitalize on it, and it didn't quite come off. But yeah, it was talked about on the news. It was talked about all across America. Um, 
and yeah, in the end, it, it probably did help. But I think that 5% of me that reveled in the controversy very quickly realized there were real LGBT people in Walsilla who were being told that there was something wrong with them, that, you know, you are something worth banning. Mm -hmm. And that's usually where my sympathies will always lie with the people that I wrote that book for. And, you know, when we published it, it was the hope that it would find its audience. And I get letters every single day from either young LGBT people or their parents thanking me for doing it. So I think that's more important than any sort of media brouhaha. But it rears its head. It happened last year as well. A school in Manchester kicked off and there was some woman in the Manchester Evening News kind of doing that face, like holding the book. And I was like, oh, crying out loud. <laughs> Thanks for the PR, by the way. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. It's publicity, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, this brings me back to your uh, to your uh, biography. Uh, I briefly introduce you, and of course, there's the um, the, the, the transition uh, that you talk about in the gender games. There's also another transition, maybe not one with a capital T, but one that strikes me as uh, not much less radical, and is that you went from full time teaching to full time writing uh, in a relative right. In a relative radical manner, right? Because there, there's this legendary summer for you where you started writing and you took those six weeks off and boom, you had a, you had a manuscript and you had your first novel. Um, do you make a conscious decision in switching between writing novels and writing these nonfiction titles between uh, being, in fact, a novelist and some, somebody who's still a teacher, an educator, or don't you just make a conscious split between those, these two at all? I mean, it was kind of necessity. I think it's hard out there <laughs> um, and I got this so I was I taught up until 2011 and I got my first book deal and it was a really good deal I sort of caught the back end of that sort of twilight mm -hmm. sort of bandwagon when there was still some real money in teen fiction and so I was able to sort of give up the day job but and this sounds so bleak and so miserable but you know I would now advise somebody, even though you think that, adva that advance on paper looked like a lot of money, it really didn't go very far. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was divided up into these eight payments. Then my agent got 15% of it, and then I got taxed to high heaven. So before I knew it, I'd given up my day job, and I was skin, and I was like, oh my God. And I knew from having been a teacher that there was a real lack of quality books about sex education and that's how I came to start writing the non-fiction so initially it was purely out of necessity I had I had to get a second book deal or I was gonna be harmless and I didn't want to go back to teaching and so yeah it was kind of there wasn't really much of a choice but it turned out to be the best thing I could have possibly have done because at that time in the sort of 2011 um young adult fiction was becoming over what's the word, oversaturated. Mm -hmm. there were, publishers were convinced they'd all found the next Twilight or the next Hunger Games, and they were just buying up more teen fiction than they knew what to do with. And becoming a voice, a not the voice, a voice for LGBT youth kind of separated me, it marked me out as a little bit different. I had a second string to my bow, so that when I was going into schools, I wasn't just promoting a novel, I was also there as a Stormall role model as well. So I kind of had a, a value beyond just being a writer. I had something else that I was able to talk about. I'm very, very glad to talk about as well, given that, you know, I was educated during Section 28, which was a conservative law under Margaret Thatcher. That meant my teachers weren't allowed to discuss gender or sexuality. Um, and, you know, so the fact that I, you know, 20 years later, I was able to be in a school, you know, talking openly as a trans woman is, it blows my mind. You know, that just would have, well, it would have been illegal 20 years ago. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. And so, yeah, it's, thank God for this book is gay. I don't know what I would be doing if it hadn't been for this book is gay. Well, on the one end of the, of the spectrum, you have the, um, the the lack of material, right? I mean, teachers who are willing uh, to talk about that in their classroom, they would gladly, of course, lay their hands on this book is gay uh, or the gender games. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, you find the, the institutional question, right? Is that actively encouraged? Is it a constant fight for you? Can you maybe talk a little about how that landscape has changed over the last two decades? I think the problem with Section 28 was that when the Labour government repealed it, they didn't put anything in its place. And that was very typical of Tony Blair's government. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of quite showy gestures, like civil partnership and scrapping Section 28 and equalising the age of consent. But 
there wasn't, there was no guidance. So particularly this onus fell on LGBT teachers who were willing to kind of, or allies who were really willing to put themselves on the line and say, look, I will happily teach sex education. You know, if nobody else is gonna do it, I will. But there was still, there was precious little guidance about what we should or should not be saying. And this is still something that the government is thrashing out. And the big concern is now it was being really championed by Justine Greening, who was um, the conservative schools minister and also a gay woman. But the problem is she stepped down now. So, PSHE, which is personal social health education in the UK, is constantly in flux. So in my time as both a student, a teacher, and a writer, we, we still have some schools that are just doing nothing. And, you know, those schools assume the parents are doing it, the parents assume the schools are doing it. So we still have now probably three generations of kids who are just getting really low quality sex education and some children who are just getting no sex education. And, you know, now clearly we're seeing something move with culture and the media and society in the wake of Weinstein and Me Too and Time's Up. And, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old girls are having conversations about consent that maybe they wouldn't have been having 10 years ago. And schools have got to catch up, you know, because as we know about the internet, yes, there's conversations on YouTube and conversations on Twitter, but they're completely unregulated. And so, you know, I've been in schools and had really grisly arguments with 14 year old boys who've accused me of being a feminazi and have accused me of, you know, kind of like, I can't believe you're coming in here and spreading the cancer of feminism. And I'm kind of like, what the hell have you been watching on YouTube? And I know exactly who they've been watching on YouTube, but this is it, we have to combat that. And, you know, these kids, and I don't say that in a patronizing way, they're so much better at being online than we are. And we've got to get better because otherwise this alt-right, if we have to call it something, you know, it's just going to continue to grow, kind of. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to that, to that issue of activism in a minute, but um, we have not yet talked about uh, your fiction, your work as a novelist at all yet. Um, of course, I hinted at that fact, and your, your uh, reading was a bit of, was proof of that. Uh, you're a very funny writer. These books are full of humor. At the same time, there's a, there's a, well, I'm hesitant to call it a dark thread, but there's something quite serious and also something quite horrific uh, running through those books, no matter what the genre. Uh, and I kept track of that when I was reading the gender games. Uh, I think one of those quotes was also in your reading. Uh, you constantly personify gender, right? Gender is, I'm just quoting here, gender is a ghost who is summoned via a Ouija board. Gender is the bogeyman. Gender is a demon sidekick. He's, uh, gender is a pedo who fucks kids. And gender will get to the children sooner or later. Um, you also call it the Gender Games, of course, which one can interpret as an allusion to the Hunger Games, one of the most dystopian young adult mm. franchises to pop up in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, how are you, I'm, I'm wondering a little how you're naturally or not so naturally drawn to the genre of horror. Why is it that you, in writing about gender, but not exclusively about gender, you find yourself constantly toying with these horror tropes? I think for me, I mean, obviously, he's on the problematic list now. Yeah, isn't it shit when your faves just fuck up? But Joss Whedon, creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, Me Too has been for him already. Um, Joss Whedon used Buffy as such a fantastic metaphor, mm -hmm. given that those teenagers were literally fighting the demons of adolescence. But, you know, I switched quite abruptly, and it was quite abrupt, from, like, Say Her Name, which was the most horrific of my horror novels, to All of the Above, which is about a bisexual girl living in a crap seaside town. And I, I often say that, actually, All of the Above is scarier than Say Her Name, because what could be more terrifying than being a mixed-race bisexual girl living in a seaside town when you're 16? Nothing could be worse than that. And so I think... It depends just how much metaphor you want there to be. I think being a young adult is horrific and is traumatic and it's something that we have all survived. And when you get to adulthood, you're like Sidney Prescott at the end of Scream. You know, you're covered in blood, you're battered, half your friends are dead. It's just, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a really horrible time. And, and I think as well, you know, given that really my puberty persists to this day, you know, and I will forever in some way be changing. Um, well, aren't we all? 
aren't we all just withering and dying as we claw our way towards the could, grave? Could you break it to them gently? Watching our beauty fade and decay. Um, we're all in transition, all of us. We're all changing, whether we like it or not. And I think there is something quite horrific about that. I think it's terrifying. I was wondering about that, because horror, in a way, is this the ultimate rite of passage genre, isn't it? Is, is, is that maybe what, what, what makes it so suitable for young adult fiction? I think, I mean, lots and lots of theses and masters and PhDs have been done on the role of feminism and horror. Mm -hmm. And horror is a very, very feminist genre. Very few films tell stories about teenage girls. And one genre that has always told stories about teenage girls is the horror genre. Mm -hmm. From Sidney Prescott to Laurie Strode to Nancy Thompson, you know, all the big horror franchises tend to revolve around a teenage girl becoming a woman. Very often, she kills a male killer, often by removing him of his own phallic weapon and killing him with it. <laughs> Sums it up for me. Horror films are very, very feminist, and um, and and you know, and yet they're very—it's quite a put-upon genre, but. Um, I think, I can't even remember how that sentence started, but yes is probably the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I came across, I'm not sure whether it was an interview or, uh, or a, a think piece you wrote for a magazine, uh, but when somebody asked, asked you to comment on the fact that you're, you're writing these strong heroines in your fiction, on the one hand you make this very existential claim for the fact that in horror fiction it doesn't really make a difference whether you pick a man or woman as a, as a hero, because once they're running away from the monster it doesn't matter, you're, you're just a survivor. But at the same time, most of the novels I've read, uh, most of the Juno Dawson novels I've read so far, do in fact have these female heroines, uh, and you tend not to write these, uh, these, these put-upon, victimized uh, men. Uh, conscious decision? Well, men what, are trash. The, the, underlying uh, <laughs> the underlying question really is what you start with. Is it the, is the, plot, is the plot, is it the, the Bloody Mary legend, or do you build around character when writing? Well, it depends slightly on the book. Um, I mean, say her name, Bloody Mary, came first, so you could say it was still based around a female character. Um, I think before I was living as Juno, writing female characters was the first stage of my transition. Mm -hmm. The way that I could live as a woman originally was to do it through my characters. And then I realized, just, you know, just cut out the middleman, you know, just do it. <laughs> what, what, this is an odd way of living, kind of. And, and there is a danger when you write fiction that you spend all your time thinking about the imaginary people who live in your head. Um, But yeah, I mean, it never, it, as soon as I started writing fiction, it never once occurred to me to write from the point of view of a boy because I've never really held the point of view of a boy. Mm -hmm. I sort of looked like one and people thought I was one. But yeah, I mean, I mean, the only good thing about transitioning, I guess, is that people have now stopped asking me, how do you write such good female characters? That one, that one died off with the transition. But um, that, was, that was the first question I always used to get. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if, if I had to pinpoint like one difference that that's struck me between your nonfiction books and and the novels, uh, I, I still come back to that notion of horror because um, in horror fiction, if I had to generalize, I would feel that the the individual usually is quite strong. The collective is where problems arise. Where I mean, I'm thinking about all these British insular communities where it's always there. They're having these creepy rituals and they're always they're always having these secret pagan cults. And there's this one outsider figure that finds him or herself trapped inside there. Um, and the way you're toying with that, right? If I think about the school environment and the bullying that's always going on in your novels, um, this is certainly there. On the other hand, the gender games is quite vocal and quite optimistic in formulating the idea that out of the collective arises something that is good, something that's positive, something that's forwards looking. How do you, how do you reconcile that difference, that tension? Oh, I don't know, really. I think, especially with the nonfiction, I think there has to be hope. Otherwise, it's just, it's just too bleak. And obviously, I'm presenting the non-fiction the non as reality, whereas the novels are fiction. And I think you're, especially with horror, it's you know, almost expected that you'll, you'll think they've gotten away with it, but then the killer gets back up or whatever at the end. But um, I didn't want to, especially with this book is gay, the last thing I would want to do is send LGBTQ youth out into the world thinking that they're letting themselves in for hardship. There is hardship, there is homophobia, there is transphobia. But those things pale in comparison to the joy of living 
your best life and living your most authentic life. And yeah, being trans is shit. It's really hard work. I wish I weren't trans. And every time I say that, I feel like it's a massive betrayal of the community I'm in. I feel it's a massive betrayal of myself and my family. But no, God, had everything been well with the world, I would have just been born a cisgender girl. Mm -hmm. And this is me making the best of a really shit situation. You know, no fucker would choose this. You know, it's hard fucking work. You know, surgeries and medication and transphobia and assholes on the internet. You know, <laughs> cisgender people get those things as well. But po possibly, you know, it's almost to be, it's almost part of being trans kind of. Um, and that's not fun. But at the same time, Ask anyone and they will tell you I am happier, more content, more myself, more sorted mm -hmm. than I ever was. And that's despite any negativity in my life. So, you know, my life now is so much better that I wanted to focus on that. And all the negative stuff is in the gender games. All the downsides mm -hmm. are in the book. But actually, I think there is more to look forward to. And I do think, you know, I lived through the 90s. I saw what happened for the, particularly the lesbian and gay community as we moved through the 90s. We moved on from the AIDS pandemic. Society, media, culture started to accept particularly white gay men and white gay women in a way that it hadn't done before. And I have hope that the transgender community will start to be folded more into culture and society in a way that gay men and women were during the 90s. We can't exist at this current level of transphobia forever. Mm -hmm. People will get bored or we will all be burnt at the stake. One of those two things will happen. And I hope it's the, the pr pr previous one. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of simplified there to, to be quite honest, right? Because um, your heroines in those novels, and I think what I get from the gender games, the same goes for you, uh, probably wouldn't have made it without these very strong friendship networks, right? Hashtag friendship, right? Uh, let's not forget about that. Um, <laughs> uh, is, is that an exaggeration or is, that, is it like a, a, a wishful projection in terms of having these very diverse casts of friends, friend networks around these heroines? Or is that something that comes from your experience? Well, no, I think it's truly experience. I mean, Kerry spoke so beautifully last night about how your first novel does tend to be slightly autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in Hollow Pike, which is a book about witchcraft in Yorkshire, I was not a teenage witch. A bit sad, I wish I had been. Um, but um, the, the thing that was real and the autobiographical element of my debut novel was, was that very diverse group of friends. And what really pissed me off about Twilight I did quite enjoy Twilight 1. Um, however, one of the things that did piss me off about Twilight was that Bella doesn't have any mates. I was like, how can this 16-year-old girl not have a single friend? This doesn't make sense. You know, I didn't care about boyfriends and girlfriends. I just wanted my squad. And so in that, in fact, in really in all of my books, the dynamic between those groups of friends is the autobiographical section. That, you know, when I was 15 and 16, more than at any other time in my life, the dynamics of my friendship group, I was very preoccupied by mm -hmm. that. And when, and this, I would suggest this because it's just fascinating. It's like watching David Attenborough watch groups of teenage girls. They cannot, they touch each other, they groom each other, they sit on each other, they lie in each other's laps. There is real, they are social creatures. It's like, slightly like watching primates in a way that as adults, I think we learn this is a bit weird, we best not do that. But teenage girls in particular are fascinating in that they, their social lives completely dominate, completely. And that's why Holopite, Cruel Summer, Say Her Name, are as much about the friendship group as they are about the romance element, which for me and my friends, we didn't really get into that until a bit later. Right. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm out on Olympia because I haven't, of course, not yet read your latest novel. Um, but before we go into the q and uh, I think maybe it's time to have another yeah. little reading there. And I think the friendship networks also feed into that book that you'll be reading from now, Clean. Yes. Although, I'll, so I'll introduce you. In fact, let me, one moment. Um, so yeah, Clean is a bit different. Clean is like a real slithering of a novel. Um, I had written sort of nice, nice novels for a while. And um, like everyone, I have a real horrible side. And it, it was a really nasty side that had slightly come out and under my skin as well with the Molly Sue alter ego. But with Clean, 
this girl, again, slightly, as Kerry said last night, Lexi, the character in Clean, just came to me. She was ready to go. And she was like, this is what we're doing. This is the way it's going to be. And she was a piece of work. And she's not very nice. Um, and she doesn't get very nice. She's not very nice at the beginning. She doesn't really become much nicer. But um, she's kind of at least aware of it. And so the friendships she forms are slightly different because she isn't the let's braid each other's hair type at all. But I'm going to do like a li little short readings um, to introduce the character of Kendall, who is actually my first trans character. Um, since I came out, a lot of my teen readers have been, in the nicest possible way, pestering, asking, when will I do a big trans novel? And as lived experience, I'm so fucking sick of being trans. The last thing I want to do is write a trans novel. So Kendall is my answer to that. And so you, I'm, you're going to get to know her through each of these quite short scenes. So I'm going to do like two little scenes. So basically, Clean is about a 17-year-old socialite hotel heiress, um, a Paris Hilton type, who is abducted by her brother and put in rehab because... She has lots of addiction problems, and throughout the course of the book, you unravel this very complicated character, and how can it be that a billionaire's daughter has hit rock bottom so young? So we pick up on Lexi. So she's detoxed. The first 100 pages are particularly gruesome. So she's now clean in the physical sense, but certainly not clean spiritually, and it's her first time at group therapy. Group is held in a different room in the old part of the house, possibly a dining room once upon a time. Maybe a library or a billiard room. This house truly is a life-size Cluedo board. There's a handsome fireplace in which a low flame crackles and two big windows looking out over the lawn. Vaguely arranged around the fireplace and coffee table are three sleek grey sofas and two armchairs. Guy and I are the first prisoners to arrive, although Goldstein hovers at the fireplace. I want to sit alone, so I select an armchair and tuck my feet under my butt. Relax, Goldstein tells me. You're not going to be forced to talk if you don't want to. I'll ask you to introduce yourself, that's all. I nod. I can do that. I can't deny I'm curious to see who I'm locked up with. The others arrive in a noisy clump, spilling through the door like a human clot. There's four of them, three girls and a guy. I see him first. Surfy hair, wet sand stubble, Malibu tan, Vice magazine masturbation material, just utterly Hoxton gorgeous. He looks my way and I give a polite nod. He has Ryan Gosling eyes that I expect cause knickers to spontaneously drop with a single glance. He's wearing a grey t-shirt and his left arm is covered in tattoos. That reminds me of Kurt, and I get an ache under my ribs. I return his nod. Behind him is the massive black girl. Christ, she's big. God, I'm such a fucking judgy bitch. I avert my eyes so she doesn't catch me staring, although not until after I clock a very expensive Rolex and quality weave. The second girl comes through the door backwards, shouting something down the corridor to a nurse. I sit up straighter in my chair. I do a double take, sucking breath in through my teeth. Antonella. Just for a second, I swear it's her. Same dead straight raven black hair, same wayfish build. But then she turns around and I see, although they're similar, this girl isn't quite as gorgeous. This girl is tall, painfully, painfully thin and gangly. Collarbones, cheekbones, wrists and knuckles. Her friend, their linked arm in arm, is a booby redhead. They all settle in their seats. I wait quietly, avoiding any eye contact. Let's get started, Goldstein says. Where's Samia? Asks the tall, skinny one as she tucks her hair behind her ears, and I see a ladder of shiny silver scars on her wrist. A cutter, but a cutter a long time ago, I'm guessing. We're expecting a new arrival, Goldstein explains. Dr. Ahmed is going to greet him. Ooh, a new boy, says the redhead with a clap. I hope he's cute, simpering fucking moron. We're all so young. It could so easily be a seminar group at school, but it isn't. I really, really 
really don't need group hugs and come by are excruciating. I wish I were high. I want to get obliterated, obliterated, to blast my head out of reality and reality out of my head. Hmm. The desire, that thirst, shocks me a little. I sit up straighter. Where did that come from? Goldstein sits next to the big girl on one of the sofas. So, he says, it's our first group with Lexi. He says in a cotton wool voice, like introducing a timid new puppy to infants. Before we get started, Lexi, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? It takes everything I have to not simply scream and throw myself through the window pane. It's really hard to be nice when you're just fundamentally not. Hi, I'm Lexi. I was basically abducted and brought here in a coma. The skinny girl smiles. The hot guy looks at me with pity in those puppy eyes. Oh, well, you can fuck right off, May. I doubt you're here for addiction to prayer. Apparently, I'm a heroin addict, I say, even more bitterly than I'd intended. So there you go. You can all stop trying to figure it out. The skinny, the skinny girl's smile broadens. Wow, how rock and roll is she? Huh, interesting. I think she might be trans. It's in the voice, strong jawline. Kendall, warns Goldstein. Hm, there you go, make-believe name. Definitely trans. Then we'll skip forward a little bit. There's more drama at dinner time. Kendall isn't gaining weight, and I know why, so they've upped her calorie intake. It doesn't go down well, and she's kept back after we all leave to finish what's on her plate. The others gather in the gym for yoga and meditation. Thanks, no thanks. Can I go make sure Kendall's okay? I asked boy nurse Marcus. Kendall's still being force-fed in, in the dining room, as far as I know. I guess, but then you both need to come down to yoga. It's not optional. Mandatory meditation. Relaxing. Okay, I'll go fetch her. I head back to the dining room, but she's gone. I follow voices and wander through to one of the activity rooms in the new box, block that looks pretty much like an art studio, the screen printing stuff and easels. Kendall is drawing at one of the workstations, making menacing black shapes with a piece of black charcoal. Round and round her arm swoops, her fingers are coal miner filthy, and she's chuntering angrily to herself. I don't think she's aware of me. I noisily clear my throat. In shock, she drops her charcoal. Fuck me hard, you scared the shit out of me. She takes a breath. And no, to answer your question, I do not feel okay. I feel disgusting. I feel bloated. I feel fat and I can feel fucking food in my fucking stomach and I hate it. She spits the last words out. I went to an all-girls school. I know it's futile to tell an anorexic anything other than what they want to hear. So I said nothing and join her in the art studio. Do you know what? I am so over how everyone wanks themselves off over food, she goes on. It's a national obsession. I'm 100% bored of talking about food. I smile. What, like those basic bitches who take pictures of avocados every five minutes? I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's an avocado. She laughs and stops circling. Oh my God, avocado. So basic. That or sourdough bread. I think there's like a periodic table of basic, I say. Kale is on there too. Or any form of juicing? She laughs, throwing her long hair back. Do you know what? We should definitely make a periodic table of basic. What else would be on it? I pull up a stool. I don't know, like men with man buns? Brady sometimes does a man bun. Yep, basic. Ooh, Kendall claps. Those colour runs with the powder paint? So basic. While you're at it, those super masculine obstacle courses where you crawl through mud and shit? She holds up a finger. People whose favourite smell is earth after the rain. So fucking basic. And extra basic points for basic bitches who think they're clever for knowing it's called petrichor. <laughs> is that what it's called? Who knew? Basic. The Kardashians? Sorry, hun, but that's fucking given. I hold up a triumphant finger. Wait, I've got it. I've got the most basic thing. Adult colouring books. Yes, mega basic. 
but then I wait. Maybe saying basic is basic. <laughs> Thanks for this. Uh, wonderful teaser for a book that's coming out in April, I believe. April in the UK, and I believe Germany in July. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it rate with the, with the other books? Is it closest to you because it's the, still the most recent one, or how, where would you uh, place it in the not inconsiderable list of, of books that you've put out so far? I think it's my best novel. I think it's my best work. I think it came, it's so strange. It was like I was possessed by it. I wrote it in six weeks. It was just, Lexi was, it's like I was possessed. And I've never, this one and Say Her Name were the ones I've had the most fun writing. And I think that joy is in the page. Oh. And I think you'll get that when you read it. Um, so I'm really proud of it. And the fact it's sold all around the world was the most wonderful validation, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have time to take questions. So anybody who feels they'd like to get involved, ask Juno something. Yes, please. The lady in the fourth row. Hi, thanks. That's, that was really funny. Um, two questions. One, how the hell do you write a novel in six weeks? I, I don't know how that happens. And the second question is um, actually more serious. Um, like you said, gender fucks children, and it happens very early. And I was wondering whether you contemplate writing a book for younger children, because I think education is really, really important. And um, yeah, is that something you thought of? Yes. And yes, um, so, I mean, in terms of writing the book in six weeks, I will say that's, that was a very rough first draft. However, what was interesting is the roughness suited it. Um, especially what happens from a writery point of view is that Lexi is just fucked for like the first hundred pages and it's almost free writing. She's coming off heroin um, and Oxycontin and Vicodin and anything she could get her little hands on. And so the writing her sentences start to become more elegant as she gets clean. Um, and so actually, strangely, yes, the first draft was rough, but it kind of stayed rough, and it was sort of like, in a weird way, it was, it was the editing process was about almost making it rougher. Um, and so that was a strange one. So yeah, the, the first draft was six weeks, but then there was another whole year of kind of working on it afterwards Okay, as well. that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, no, fear not, oh no. I mean, no. I think, so hang on, let me, so the timeline was, I think I started it in the summer of 2016. It was really naughty. I was meant to be writing the gender games, but Lexi, she had that story to tell. And that was another reason I couldn't agonize over it because I was, I was already contracted to do the gender games. And, um, and I think we sold it that December. So actually, from starting it to selling it, it was about six months. So it was still fairly quick turnaround. Um, and then actually, in terms of, yes, there was some conversation about doing like a PG edit of the Gender Games at one point, which is what they'd done for Malala Yousafzai's book. So they'd done a more violent and less violent version. But then in the end, the gender games, the PG version would be a pamphlet. So <laughs> there's like, well, let's not that. So the same publisher, we, in fact, it's over there. It's called um, What is Gender and Other Big Questions for Kids. And it's part of a series that Hachette are doing. There's one called What is Feminism? What is a Refugee? What is Consent? And I was tapped to do the What is Gender one. So it is there's real basics, like what's the difference between sex and gender, you know, what is gender stereotyping, what is feminism, pitched at an eight-year-old. And strangely, um, Sabrina's partner, Anthony, features in their writing about masculinity as well. So that was lovely to draw in some of my friends as well and get their takes on gender too. First row. Thank you. Um, you're not the first. Oh, thank you very much. I liked it very much. I've read quite a bit of uh, your books. I mean, gender games, etc. So it's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> first thing is, you are not the first woman who writes a book in six weeks. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, wrote Vindication also. We're very six similar weeks. <laughs> as writers. Yeah. <laughs> so it's honourable ancestry. Uh, the other question is, um, what about the book market? Was it difficult to uh, publish the first books? Or do you think that there is suddenly a kind of market for these um, yeah, 
this kind of books, books with uh, concentrating on sex, on LGBT, etc. Because I think about 20 years ago, it would have been very difficult. Mm. Um, I think there have been moves to be more inclusive within the publishing. I think the publishing industry is now like depressingly late, is aware that it has a massive diversity problem. And you know, you go to any big publishing event and you're like, wow, you are all called Helen. And you all <laughs> went to UEA. And you all look like you have a pony waiting for you at home. Lots of swishy blonde ponytails. Um, and, and yet then all the men, are, all the CEOs are men still. So it's like, great. Um, but I think it's realized that. And it's taking steps to redress the balance, accepting that publishing is not and has never been a level playing field. And we were talking about this on the tube this morning with. Um, and so actually, we do need some, for want of a better phrase, affirmative action. Otherwise, we're never going to have anything like a, a diverse publishing community. But it does seem to be that I keep getting lucky. And I've, I always say this, that publishing much too often relies on timing. Um, you know, I looked out with Holla Pike. I caught the very tail end of Twilight Fever. Had I tried to sell Holla Pike six months later, it wouldn't have sold because all anybody wanted was Hunger Games ripoffs and I hadn't written one. So luckily my book about teen, teen witchcraft was just similar enough to Twilight, but also just different enough to, to sell and get a lovely book deal. Whereas now, Hollow Pike would be dead in the water. No one would give two shits. Um, in fact, getting published as a young adult author now is now impossible because in the UK, we've not had a homegrown Hunger Games or a homegrown John Green. And so the UK market has completely lost faith in teen fiction and has retreated to what it does well, which is that kind of scones and jam, jolly hockey sticks, St. Trinian's, Harry Potter-esque, kind of like, Trini and I were at boarding school when there was a murder. And it's, it's all very, very twee, very British. And I just can't write that. I cannot write about Helen and her pony. I just couldn't give two shits. So it's, it's yeah, it's, and so, but I mean, Look, second lucky strike times two, which is I was already an established writer at the start of my transition. So everybody was like, brilliant, we've already got her. She's already in the system. So just, just as people were interested to listen what, to what trans people had to say, although I will say actually very interested to listen to a certain type of trans person. We hear so little from trans men. We hear so little from non-binary people. And all the trans women we do hear from look like me. We're all white, we're all very feminine, we're all, we all very much conform to very limited notions of what women should look like. So there's still a lot of work to do. You sure you couldn't churn out something on Helen on her pony by the end of February? I mean, you're fast. I could, well, do you know, no, because you know, a couple of times I have tried to be cynical, maybe like a year and a half ago, maybe I was running out of money or something, I don't know. Um, I thought, right, I need to write one of these thrillers like Gone Girl on a Train, like thrillers, kind of. And so I was going to write a book, you know, like, because they're all the same book. It's like, you think it's the husband, and it is. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's all of those books. And so I did, I, I sat down to start writing my You Think It's the Husband and It Is book. And I hated every minute. I was like, this is so cynical. And again, the joy that I think you will get from Clean was absolutely absent. There was no joy in that whatsoever because it was workmanlike. Well, you could always make a case for it being the husband's twin brother. And, Possibly, yeah, sorry. I love yeah. a secret twin, yeah. It just, it just occurred to me, sorry, we're taking the next question straight away. Uh, all three, all three uh, writers who have presented so far during this event have come forward to say that it was some sort of epiphany for them that writing and getting published was not exclusively for Oxbridge men, that it was something really that was in a way out of the ordinary, which is interesting, I guess. And that's one of, one of the things I love about publishing is that theoretically it's open to everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is, I remember once saying to one of my friends, you know, no one has ever asked me if I went to Oxbridge. And my friend Kerry in a second said, because they would have already known. <laughs> and I was like, okay, there were more questions in the back row somewhere there, yes, or first, Monique, yeah. Um, I, I've got a question somewhere, it might, it might come out in a very 
uh, non-linear way, but something you said about going into schools and then a young boy calling you a feminazi and the alt-right, and then Tinder and your experiences there, which, you know, is heartbreaking. And, and I'm wondering, um, and you're talking about uh, sex education in schools needed, you know, and I guess my question is something about um, not trashing cisgender patriarchal masculinity, trying to be, trying to change, trying to change the whole game. Yes. And about cis masculinity and patriarchy and the whole fucking thing that hurts everybody. And I've just, and this is a really big, broad question, so I'm not even sure. But do you know what I'm trying to say? Can which I is, fix it's gender? The it's the elephant in the room, which is, I hate to say, is it, me, is it cis men? You know, what are we, how are we going to be affirmative and, cha and game change the uh, thing that hurts us all? That, I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it starts, we need everyone include an especially especially sorry especially the cisgender men to acknowledge that there's something wrong and i think that's what we're seeing with now with times up and me too which is even i mean and for me this you know it's i i'm so pleased that i get to live through this little bit of history and i think we are standing at a little bit of history in terms of feminism and the way that women and our bodies and our consent and our sexuality is being discussed in a way like never before. You know, women's pay at the BBC is back in the news again today. It's, this is great. I hope it lasts and I hope these conversations, I hope we don't get bored of them. But it was with Aziz Ansari that I found particularly fascinating because Aziz Ansari was meant to be one of the good ones. And I think what Aziz Ansari, the case, and if we're not sure, he is an American comedian who details of a somewhat excruciating date in which he'd behave like a shit. He behaved like a shit on a shit date and he completely misread the signs his female partner was giving and it was, he was gross. And, but then a lot of men sort of said, why, well, I, don't, I don't really think he acted out of, I don't, you know, if, if she wasn't going to explain that she wasn't. And I was like, oh, come on. We need to really look at what underpinned that. An entire culture that said women will always withhold sex so that they're not seen as sluts. So men should always push for sex because it's what women expect of them. The system is fucked. And that was the system that Aziz Ansari and his partner were operating in. So it's about, we all have to acknowledge that. We all have to acknowledge that our culture, and call it rape culture if you want, you know, some people don't like it being called rape culture. Call it rape culture, but that's, that's the playing field, and we've got to change that. So there's no point in lynching Aziz Ansari because he, that was just emblematic of the playing field and the culture that he was raised in, you know? And so I think that that's, that's what we have to do. But I think men are. And I think I've read think pieces now, because obviously initially the gross thing about Me Too was that all women were expected to perform their sexual assault or you weren't a feminist. And I was like, well, hang on a minute. I mean, what, what if, you know, I have done, I talk about my rape in, in the gender games, but I had friends who, for them, discussing their experiences of sexual assault is incredibly painful. And no, they didn't want to do it on Facebook and Twitter to say they were a feminist. And so it, for me, it was about slightly putting the onus onto men sort of saying, actually, and I've read several pieces by men saying, yes, I've, I've done this because I thought that's what I was sort of meant to do. And so that's, that's what we need. We almost need to reset. I think, but it's a big task. This is global, earth-shattering, fundamental stuff. But I don't think it's biological. I mean, that's what some of our alt-right friends have suggested, that somehow masculine sexual dominance is biological. And I'm not sure it is, because, you know, rarely in our lives are we entirely led by evolution and yet somehow when it suits us we're allowed to fall back on that as some sort of an excuse and i don't, I don't think it is anyone like to ask a follow-up to this one because i know we have another question coming up but 
It, of course, opens a whole different book. Okay, the gentleman in the back row, I think you had a question. Is it Aziz Ansari? Sorry. <laughs> He's walked already. <laughs> he left. Um, just uh, as someone who uh, you were talking about working uh, in high schools, um, I'd just be interested to ask you if you think it's important for LGBT teachers uh, to identify and be visible in the classroom with their students, or whether that's, um, yeah, what's the line between being public or, or private in that? Um, I don't think it's the responsibility of heterosexual or cisgender people to be straight cisgender role models in schools. I think straight and cisgender PE teachers can just do PE. <laughs> and it's a shame that being an LGBT teacher comes with this weird extra job that you're not being paid any extra for. So fuck that. So it's completely a choice. Um, and I think it's entirely down to the choice of that staff member. I think, and this is so, I mean, I should have probably started an hour and a half ago by saying, you know, I do not speak for anybody other than Juno Dawson. There is no one way to be trans. There is no one way, there is no gay experience or lesbian experience. There are infinite, there is many ways to be trans as there are trans people. So I don't think we can ever say it's the responsibility of a trans teacher to be a role model because that person might have all kinds of stuff going on. They might be living stealth, they might not be out as trans, um, it might not be safe for them to be out as trans depending on where they are. So, you know, it's, it has to be a personal choice on behalf of that professional. Because like I've said, you know, it's not a responsibility that falls on heterosexual or cisgender staff. There's a question in the middle there, yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. And I, I mean, for a lot of disadvantaged communities, public libraries are the source of like information and education to get them through hardship. So with this uh, like book censor censorship and stuff going on, so how how what can we do to just to reach out to these communities and let them know that uh, that you I mean you have access to hope, but like but we just don't have the books. But it's it feels, I mean, for me, it feels like a, I don't know, it feels like a, uh, I don't, it's like a downward spell where you just go nowhere, but you need that thing, and in order to get that thing, you have that thing, but you, need, but you just don't, and so it's like, yeah, I'm doing that babbler thing when I'm nervous, so I'm That's sorry. Okay. <laughs> so am, am I thinking about, we're talking about the importance of libraries, or the danger of censorship, or both? Um, I mean, libraries, Kerry spoke so eloquently about the importance of libraries. I was the same. I came from, I was born into a council house in Bradford, and books are expensive. They are expensive. And so, you know, when I got my library card, I was like, are you fucking kidding? I can take six books for free. Like, this is... And, you know, I used to mainline Doctor Who paperbacks, one after the next, after the next, after the next. And, you know, I'm still a massive Doctor Who fan 30 years on. So, you know, it really set me up for life. It created a love of reading. Um, it's a crime. It's, it's a crime that libraries are being cut and underfunded. It's, I think, a form of social cleansing. I think that, you know, we're creating one set of a society for those who can afford books and a society for those who can't and without access to books. It's so dangerous, and you know, you know, books already are the the domain of the white middle class. You know, if we were to go to a, a bookshop and go to the children's section, there's a lot of books about Helen and that pony. So we're already telling children that books and the, in fact, not just books, fiction and the world of fantasy belongs to a certain type of child, and that's why you know it's you know, and imagine if you can't even get to the books, you know, it's horrific, and we have to protect libraries with everything, and especially school libraries and school librarians. You know, there's no point in having a school library without a librarian in it. It's like we have to have to defend these things. In terms of censorship, I mean, what, what else can you say other than it is bad? Um, I mean, I, I would even, to a, to a degree, defend the right of people like our alt-right friends, but then we do, we already have very definite existing laws on hate speech. 
and that that is laws. And I think sometimes even that's too grey an area. But I think, you know, very often when we talk about free speech, it's just an excuse for really awful people to say really terrible things. But um, I think censorship is is something we have to be really, really careful about because if we start censoring and we start saying a certain type of censorship is all right, you know, it, it might it might never stop. And certainly some of, you know, as somebody who has been censored, um, you know, I sort of felt broadly protected, you know, by what at the time was the Obama administration. Now I wouldn't feel so secure. You know, the right of people in America to read a book like This Book is Gay might not be around forever. So I think we have to be super, super careful regarding censorship because things could just get worse and worse and worse. Maybe we have time for one final brief question if anyone else like to venture one. Yes, there is one timidly raised hand. Yes. I think, thank you so much for your reading. Um, I, just listening to that uh, last excerpt from, from Clean, uh, it was really um, impressive how much you were able to channel um, teen culture and, and teen language. And um, you know, once we leave that uh, period of our lives and you know, being sort of plugged into the latest slang and, and the, the way that people describe each other. Um, they're universals from, from your own teenage years, I'm sure. Um, but things like the way the word basic is used uh, seems so specific to this time. And I'm wondering how you remain, you're able to keep channeling characters this age through different generations of teenage culture. I mean, it's incredibly hard, and you've got to be super careful of things that date, which is why basic, even Lexi acknowledges, has basic already dated, and it probably has. But I, I like to think that possibly we'd still be using it in an ironic way, if nothing else. Um, I mean, Heather's is the best example. Just create your own slang. We are writers. You know, part of the fun of doing our job is that you get to play with language. And so, you know, I... I never mention pop culture references wherever possible, and if I do, I create my own. And obviously Brady in Clean turns out to be a, reality, a washed up reality child star, kind of, from, from his own kind of Kardashian, Osborne's empire, kind of. Um, so yeah, you just, you just sort of make up, but I think the reason that so many adults in particular love YA fiction, and it's strange, because I think the you know, people forget that YA does stand for young adult. So, it, you know, adults do enjoy it and do buy it. And it's because we were all teenagers, you know, and it's such a singular time of life. And it's, everything is so heightened. And obviously, I did my second puberty a couple of years ago. Um, wouldn't recommend it. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of have, to basically mess with my hormones as an adult because it was like being a teenager but with like a level of slightly top-down understanding on what was going on. So I knew why my body was changing. I knew why I wanted to kill everyone. I knew why I was bursting into tears all the time. But of course, as a teenager, you don't know why that's happening. And you kind of, you have all these fucking adults aren't you going mood swings and you just want to fucking kill them um because you're like how have you forgotten what this feels like you know you've you are so far removed from this you know and you know obviously as soon as my sort of second puberty started you know all my girlfriends were like well yes welcome to pmt this is what it's like um and also slightly similar, a lot of the same effects of the menopause as well. So I think just all women are slightly more perhaps in tune with this idea of hormones. And it was so interesting listening to Monique this morning because I perhaps, again, just speaking for myself, I cannot speak for all trans people, but I became very, very aware of the role that hormones have played in my life. So for the first 27 years, I honestly thought I was some sort of sex addict. I was like, what is going on? Do I need to speak to a therapist about this? This is crazy. Um, you know, thinking about partners and sex took up just such a huge part of my head. And then obviously got to 29. Every three months, I go have a little shot in my butt, which completely kills all the testosterone in my body. Oh, would you look at that? Couldn't give two shits. 
there was nothing wrong with me. There wasn't, it wasn't anything about the culture I was living in. It wasn't anything to do with the people I was dating. It wasn't anything to do with Grindr. I was just fucking full of hormones. Because that one thing has changed. I just put a load of estrogen in, took a load of testosterone out, and I'm like, oh my God, I just want to read a book. <laughs> Like, that, that's lovely, but could you put the kettle on, kind of, is, is just sort of... And, and that, that was the thing, and I don't think... Because I wasn't... Obviously, growing up, I wasn't slut-shamed, so I, I don't think it's that. I don't think I'm now worried about being slut-shamed. I don't think it's anything to do with how I regard my body or my sexuality or my hair or anything. I just think I have no testosterone in me. So it's just... It's, and it's completely changed... The way, the way I see myself. So I think it's about that slight recognition of a period of our time, a period of our lives where we are all very much slaves to our hormones. And again, the fun is, of course, putting that in either just as it is or through, through metaphor. And certainly one of the things my novels have in common is the characters tend to go in children and come out as adults. And I think, obviously, as a trans person, that kind of, it was always there, kind of. Couldn't have thought of a better closing statement myself. Speaking of putting the kettle on, I know that lunch is coming up. Has been an absolute pleasure talking to Juno, listening to you. And thank you, you as well, thank Vila, you so and thank you very much for your questions as well. Uh, thank you. Clean is out in April. Uh, Helen and her pony will hit bookstores this Christmas, <laughs> I'm told. Um, and, yeah, let's hear it for Juno once more. Thank you very much.